Welcome back, it's me, Lou, and I'm here for another action figure unboxing and review. And today I am looking at this Star Wars, the Black Series, Bo Katan. So, if you're a fan of Star Wars The Mandalorian, and who isn't, or if you grew up on Star Wars The Clone Wars, um, you're going to love this character. Uh, it was very cool that they took a character that existed in CG animated form and brought her to life on the... I was about to say big screen, but <laughs> it wasn't the movies. Um, and brought her to life on the you know in live action form on the small screen. So here we have uh, Bo Katan. Um, I'm very excited to have this figure, even though I've kind of slowed down on Star Wars: The Black Series. Um, I'll I'll pick up the occasional figure. This is one I definitely wanted. Um, I really wanted more of the recent Mandalorian releases, but it kind of pissed me off that some of them were Walmart exclusives. And Walmart exclusives in my neck of the woods, they're always hard to come by. It's always a crapshoot whether or not my stores get them. Um, <laughs> most of the time, it's they never get them. And if they do, I think it's limited quantities and they just sell super fast. I live in an area where it's highly competitive. There are a lot of collectors. So yet, you know, early bird gets the worm. And sometimes I just miss out. But I was fortunate enough to find this actually in store and here it is so as with many of the black series figures this comes in the more recent packaging you have the embankment on this side of the box and on this spine you have some beautiful character artwork showcasing Bo-Katan and a couple of I believe there's are death watch members flying overhead uh, the package the window frames the figure um, beautifully it's nice that they have her helmet off, so you know you got to mask the figure. She has her pistols off to the side. It's beautiful. On the back, another character portrait, and it says, A gifted warrior, Bo-Katan is a legendary Mandalorian. She refused to align with the Empire's occupation of Mandalore. So, there we go. Bo-Katan. Alright, let's take this out. Okay, first impressions out of the box and still in the plastic tray. Um, I think the first thing I thought of when I saw this figure is she looks short. Um, I'll pull out another Black Series figure in a little bit to compare the height, but for some reason I just looked at her and I'm like, she looks kind of short. Now I'm not really sure how tall uh, the actress Katie Sackhoff is, um, but it looks short. So for those of you that remember, um, the actress Katie Sackhoff, she appeared in Sci-Fi's reboot of Battlestar Galactica, and it, I don't know, she fits the role of Bo-Katan perfectly. Uh, the likeness is pretty spot on. Um, let me see my camera get that in focus. Uh, the sculpting's beautiful. Nice crisp details. The paint application looks um, like what you'd expect from the Black Series. There's some battle damage on her breastplate. And that's a nice detail. Uh, her helmet looks a little weathered, which is cool. Kind of shows that she's been in the trenches for a while. Okay, um, let's take a look at her up close. Up close and personal with Bo-Katan. So for me, even though, you know, I, I think it's, it was cool that they brought her onto the Mandalorian. And it's awesome, like, what she represents. And it kind of carries... It, I think it's always cool when they take something that existed in other fictional forms, like whether it be the comic books or the animation... And then they bring it to life in the um, in the live action form because it kind of like really justifies and it kind of canonizes it too, where it's like you know, because many times, especially back in the day, anything that was in the comic books or animation sometimes it'd be considered EU, which which stands for um, expanded 
or, or extended universe. And continuity is, is one of those things that it's always kind of plagued, like Star Wars fans, uh, the hardcore fans especially. Uh, because people get very, they, they get married to some of the fictions that they really love. Like, you know, if you're a fan of the novels, you know, you, re you really want to acknowledge that those exist and that the stuff that happens there, um, you know, takes place in the movie universe. You know, likewise, if you're a fan of the comic books, uh, you'd like to think that those stories count also. And I remember um, Steve Stansweet, he used to be the, I think he was like president of like fan relations at Lucasfilm for a long time. And he was kind of like the premier authoritative um, figure when it came to Star Wars collecting collectibles. And I remember he had a classification system for um, Star Wars uh, material and fiction. So like he labeled something as G canon, meaning George canon. So anything that took anything that George Lucas created or considered Star Wars, whether it, it was in the movies or not, you know, since it came from George's head and his hand, it counts as official. But then he had another classification, I think, that was this strictly limited to um, what you saw on screen. So if it happened in the movies, that was official canon, and that was it. And he understood the need that people, um, you know, were very fond of the expanded universe. So there was a third classification for if it took place like in the novels or in the comic books or in the animations or some of the other fictions like the video games, it counts, but it's, it was considered something else. So in a way, he respected that, 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 that you know, people view the Star Wars universe differently and that he was accepting of the fact that some people only count the movies as the true um, history of Star Wars, where some people like to include the um, extra bits like the novels and comics. And then he also you know, appreciate the fact that, you know, George Lucas is essentially the god of Star Wars. So anything that came from his mouth was was the was the final word. But I think it mostly just depends on the fans. You know, everyone kinda you know, has their give and take on what Star Wars is. Um, you know, I have a lot of friends that are fans of Star Wars, but, you know, everyone's level of fandom is very different. Like uh some of my friends you know, I remember some uh, one of my friends from college, she was at my house once. Uh, my my good friend Erica, and then she was thumbing through my DVDs, and uh, it was I think this might have been like maybe a month or two after Phantom Menace came out, and then she was looking at it, asking if she could borrow it, and then I'm like, "Why wow, you're into that kind of stuff?" She's like, "Yeah, I'm a Star Wars fan," and then uh, it's it's kind of just struck me right then there is that everyone's different in terms of being a Star Wars fan. Um, like you know, some people are crazy Star Wars fans, and you know they live and breathe Star Wars. And it's their it's their religion. And then there's some people like me where I love Star Wars, but I love it differently. You know, I take it to bed with me, and I hug it and caress it, and I love it. <laughs> now I'm joking, but um, it Star Wars is just one of those things where everyone views it differently. And I think it it, it kind of got like that the last I think more so the last ten years uh, because the the level of fandom it's it's become so huge and. I think one of the nice things about The Mandalorian is that it finally, it kind of bridged that gap between people that were into like the deeper fiction and the people that were just really into the movies. Because I think with the advent of Disney Plus, you know, a lot of people got it because, you know, it, Disney Plus was a cool thing. You know, a lot of parents got it because it, there's a giant library of videos and movies for their kids. But it's cool that The Mandalorian kind of brought everyone together. Is like the one thing Star Wars fans could kind of agree on that was cool. Like, I love the prequels. I'm, I love them since day one. I don't have a problem. I'm not one of those people that hate Jar Jar Binks and, you know, this poo poo's on everything prequels. I love the prequels. And I grew up on the original trilogy. My first, one of the first movies I ever saw in the movie theater was The Empire Strikes Back. Um, I was probably like four when I saw that in the theaters. And. Uh, it's I don't know. It's just been cool. So it's it's kind of cool because I've I have friends who were into Star Wars and stuff like the Mandalorian kind of pulled them back into into um into the loop. You know they're interested again. But at the same time, it's kind of weird because you know something like the Mandalorian could get people excited about Star Wars, but they might not give something like the Bad Batch a chance just because it's a cartoon. 
And, um, you know, a lot of people, you know, they're not familiar with the Bo-Katan character because chances are they didn't watch Clone Wars or any of the animation. So it's, it's really cool how, you know, stuff like the Mandalorians kind of pulled everyone together. It was a nice bridge. But focusing more on Bo-Katan, um, I love the Mandalorians, but... There's a part of me that kind of thinks that at some I mean, if they haven't already, it's like, it, it waters down. Every time they introduce a new Mandalorian character, for me, it always waters down Boba Fett. It was kind of like that with Star Trek. Like, the Klingons were really cool. They were cool bad guys in the original series. In, in the original movie, tri or in the original movies, the first six movies, they were, they were cool in that. And then they were awesome in... Um, it was always awesome to see Klingons in the next generation, you know, especially whenever they had Lursa and Betor on the on the um the sisters, on the show, and of course everyone loved Worf. And then it it got I think it reached its height in Deep Space Nine when they had the Klingons because they really got deep and they really explored the mythology of the Klingons and their culture and it was they they weren't just villains anymore they were very complex characters they were, you know, these warriors and it was just, it was awesome. But then at some point in time, it just got kind of like, we're getting too much Klingons. And then Voyager started exploring more because they had Balana on the show. And then she would do that thing where it was like Klingon Day. And then even though she's half Klingon, she wanted to represent her Klingon pride. And then I'm like, this is getting to be too much. And it's it, Klingons, for some reason, they just felt to be like watered down. And I'm starting to feel like that with the Mandalorians. Kind of like, all right, we have, you know, Boba Fett and Jango Fett. They were super cool. And then they introduced the Mandalorian. I'm like, that's awesome. But now they're bringing in the Death Watch, which I, I'll, I'll be honest, I was excited about it. I, li I like the idea of the Death Watch. Like for Bo-Katan, um, you know, Mandalore in the Clone Wars is kind of depicted as this very sophisticated culture that was into like the arts and the finer things. And this, you know, but at the same time, there are people like Bo-Katan and she was a patriot and she kind of came from a warrior class. So you got to tell there were divisions in her society and it's kind of cool now that they bring the character on and that she just wants to reclaim the world for for itself you know it's, it has nothing to do with the republic or whatever it's just about she's it's her wanting her people to be back in place and then she wants to be the figurehead of it um so it's cool that they have that on the show but it's like for every time they introduce a character that looks like boba fett it's like for me it's kind of like this stop already we have too many you know, it was, it was cool when I was a kid because he was the only character that had a jet pack, you know, and, and it was cool because he hid behind this mask and there was an anonymity an about him. But nowadays it's kind of like so many Mandalorians. It's like, it's just stop. <laughs> just stop already. It's not like I watch. I'm a big fan of pro wrestling. It's like, I only need one Undertaker. You know, don't give me any more Undertakers. You know, I think every now and then they might they might fiddle around with it with that idea. Like there was one wrestler they tried introducing as like the white Undertaker. It was like Mordecai. And that just bombed. It was a guy, he kind of looked like The Undertaker, kind of like behaved like The Undertaker, but he instead he was wearing all white and it, it never took off. It, it like died on, a, on arrival. You know, it's not always going to work. Um, so, you know, with this figure, it's cool. Um, her head spins around, her arms spin around. They go out, and it's nice that they go out too, because it's not hindered by her shoulder. They, they kind of made the gap here um, wide enough so that when he goes out, it accommodates for that. It's it's, it's not going to go all like super high up, but it goes high enough. Um, she has elbow bend and elbow swivel. You can move the wrist around. Um, kind of twist her below her chest instead of a waist swivel. Uh, her holster and her belt sit up a little higher. Which is okay because I think traditionally the Mandalorian costumes, their belts are thicker and, and they actually fall above the waist. Um, she has holsters to hold her weapon, which is my one of my favorite things. I hate it when toys come with, like especially action figures, when they come with like multiple guns and accessories, but you have nowhere to put them. So it's cool that she can store her her blasters in the holsters. Um, she has a thigh cut. She bends at the knees. It's a nice cut too, the way they cut it here. Um, nice ankles and the paint application is great and I like the helmet it's not 
it's not deformed or anything, especially since it's made of a softer plastic. You know, her, her sights can come down. It's cool. It's cool, cool, cool. So speaking of other Mandalorian figures we could compare it to, um, I don't have Mando on me. He's still in the box, hanging on a wall, both versions. But I do have Grandpa Jango Fett. I have Boba Fett. This is the first Black Series release, which I think is superior to the deluxe one that came out recently. So that's just my opinion, but I, I always say just because it's new, I, it doesn't always mean it's going to be better. I think this is the superior figure to the new deluxe one. And then here's a bargain um, Hasbro Impulse Buy Mandalorian. I got this at Walmart. It's neat. I love this little figure a lot. Even though it only has three points of articulation, the sculpting is beautiful. You know, so don't sleep on this figure. It's awesome. So height-wise, she's shorter than Django. She's shorter than Boba. Um, this figure is a smaller scale, so we're not going to count this. Yeah. It's, it's really neat. I like the figure a lot. So if I had to rate Bo-Katan numerically, my first thought in honesty was a 9. Um, you know, I think I sometimes think I, over, I might overrate things, but uh, it met all my expectations, to be honest. Um, I love the fact that you can mask her. I love the fact that the helmet, the scale of it looks proper on her head. It doesn't look too big. Nor is it too small. Her sculpting's beautiful. The tension to detail's fabulous. It's great. Uh, her articulations, it all works. Everything does what it should. Uh, maybe the one thing is, uh, not she could look up so she could fly. Whoosh. Uh, yeah. So this is a great figure. Uh, yeah, easily an eight and a half to nine. Um, it's definitely worth the purchase if you're into. If you're into the Mandalorian, and right now you're, you're, it's a field day. There's so many Mandalorian figures you could buy. Um, there were those Walmart exclusives. I believe they kind of had that. The Darth Maul loyalist, you know, the one that's like black and red and has this, the horns on the helmet. Uh, there was the Death Watch. I think there for a while there was the... If, it was an exclusive for a while, but I think you can find it readily available at other online retailers. But there was the Heavy Mandalorian. The one that had, the, he was like the big swole looking guy with the big gun. There's three different versions of Din Djarjean. Um, there's the two, there's the initial release, the Beskar armor, and then the one that, the deluxe one that comes with uh, Grogu and the Pram, and you can remove his hat or his, his helmet. So yeah, there's just so many. There's the new deluxe Boba Fett figure. I think GameStop might have had an exclusive Jango Fett re-release under their, what is it, like, Gaming Greats line. So yeah, if you love Star Wars characters with jetpacks and helmets, there's a lot of figures to choose from. Um, so go nuts. Okay, let's wrap things up. Um, uh, go out, buy this figure. She is wonderful. Um, I'm sure for every figure you buy, Katie Sackoff probably gets like a penny, so... <laughs> Once again, my name is Lou. Um, I appreciate you dropping by. I hope you had something that you pulled away from this video, whether it helped you decide whether or not you want to buy it or you just enjoy hearing me babble for like 15 to 40 minutes about nothing. So feel free to visit me anytime. Um, I hope you have a wonderful day and take care.